Booster 12 has completed engine testing, which means it's been rolled back to the production site to get ready for Starship Flight 5, and hopefully Booster Catch 1. Meanwhile, Ship 30 is undergoing preparations for an engine testing campaign of its own, and we've seen an insane amount of progress already on the second orbital launch pad here in Starbase. And on top of all of that, we've gotten our first glimpses at Starship version 2 hardware, which of course we have to talk about. Howdy Star fans, I'm Jack Byer for NSF, and this is your Starbase Update. Let's start off by talking about Starbase's shiny new second tower. And I really mean that. If you take a look at Tower B versus Tower A, it really does look shiny and new. If you watched our last Starbase update, you will definitely notice the striking progress being made on Tower B and just how fast SpaceX is working to get this tower constructed. SpaceX rolled out Module 2 for Tower B just at the end of last week and proceeded to stack it a few days later. But without even stopping to catch their breath, just the very next night, they rolled out Module 3, and it was quickly stacked as well. So to summarize, in just a week, Tower 2 has gone from one module in total to three. And there might be another one by the time you watch this, because there is a road closure, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But it just goes to show how quickly SpaceX is building Pad B. As we've mentioned many times in the past, these tower modules are a lot more complete with a lot of additional hardware installed compared to the first tower here in Starbase or even the tower that was built at Launch Complex 39A. That means that whenever these modules are stacked, there's a whole lot of work to be done to connect all of the pipes that run up and down the tower. Though, even with all of that work, it's still a lot better than having to install all that stuff on the tower after you've already built it. Like you have to be on a lift and go way up high and there has to be cranes. It's a whole big pain. So they're saving themselves some trouble. We've already seen these connections start to appear, at least on the big cryogenic pipes that carry liquid methane and liquid oxygen up to the ship. The pneumatic and hydraulic lines might take a little bit longer to get fully connected. Once all the modules are stacked and the structure is complete, SpaceX will be able to install the carriage and chopsticks onto the tower. To move the carriage up and down the tower, it needs a new set of drawworks, which includes a cable and some pulleys. As it turns out, a large cable spool was delivered to the launch site this week, which does kind of feel a little bit premature, unless SpaceX really, really thinks they can get this whole entire Pad B built rather quickly, which I certainly won't be complaining if that's the case. Now, not everything around Tower 2 involves building it up. Some of it involves digging down. And no, I'm not talking about a potential future flame trench. I'm referring to the digging that's been ongoing for a while near the back of the tower, which, if you're not familiar with, would be the side closest to Highway 4, since Tower B's orientation is different relative to Tower A, or Tower 1 and 2. I don't know. We're still not fully sure why they're digging there, but given its location, it's not like we're making a leap of faith thinking that it's related to the second launch pad. It could be anything from a water deluge tank farm to just a trench to hold a bunch of GSC pipes that will connect the pad and tower to the orbital tank farm. Right now, it's just a little hard to guess. Speaking of digging, there's been a whole bunch of that going on at the new launch site entrance we suspect is being built next to Starhopper. And it would make a lot of sense for them to do this, because the current main entrance to the launch site sort of just goes straight into the orbital tank farm, which any large things being transported, like say, I don't know, a booster or a ship, has to kind of thread the needle between vaporizers, tanks, the guard shack, and Starhopper. It's got to be a pain in the butt, and logistical difficulties aside, it just doesn't look very grand to take a right turn and be faced with a whole bunch of tanks. Really, a new launch site entrance with proper Gateway to Mars vibes makes a lot of sense, as long as they don't touch Starhopper. Don't you touch Starhopper. Next up, as I alluded to at the beginning of the show, by the time you watch this, SpaceX might have already rolled out Tower Module 4 to the launch site. Why do we think that? Because on Monday, there is a transportation road closure from midnight to 3 a.m., and that transportation is slated to only take one hour. So in all likelihood, that is for the next Tower Module to roll out to the launch site and eventually be stacked on the rest of the tower. This week, we saw workers prepping the next two modules for rollout, 
And if you don't remember, these are modules four and five, which were the most recently delivered from Florida and transported from the port to the Sanchez lot. It really wouldn't surprise me if by the next Starbase update, both modules four and five have been stacked on the tower, which would mean in about a week, the second tower at Starbase would be well over half complete, which is just insane. Speaking of those two modules, which were recently transported from Florida, they had some company on the barge they were transported on. That company, of course, was the chopsticks and carriage system for the second tower here in Starbase. And those two were rolled from the port of Brownsville to the Sanchez lot this week. It's quite a sight to see these weird looking and massive structures rolling down Highway 4. I mean, think about it. The first time SpaceX built a carriage and chopsticks, they did it here at the launch site. Then, when they built them for Launch Complex 39A in Florida, they were transported on roads that the public can't really get up close to. So this is sort of the first time something like this has happened. Certainly, it's going to be a little bit at least until these parts are needed and ready to be installed on the tower, but you might as well use the transport closures you have and get them out of the port. They can't sit there forever. If you remember from last week, Booster 12 completed a somewhat weird cryogenic test, which we discussed in our previous episode, so check that out if you're behind. And then it underwent a spin prime test. This was the first spin prime test of a super heavy booster since Booster 9, and of course, we were all eagerly awaiting the big test, a static fire. As usual, the road was closed, the pad was cleared, and the tank farm spooled up. Propellant load began, and just 40 to 50 minutes later, Booster 12 engines came to life. While we didn't know at first how well or how bad it went, it all looked pretty much nominal, and it seemed to have run just like the previous static fire tests we've seen. The countdown was also silky smooth, which kind of makes it seem like they have this whole testing thing really nailed down now. Later, SpaceX confirmed that the test had been a full duration one and posted some absolutely mind-boggling drone videos of the static fire. I think these are the very best videos we've gotten from SpaceX to date of a booster static fire with some seriously killer angles. No, I, like, I mean it, they're killer angles. If you were there, you'd be dead. You'd just be dead. They're literally killer angles. I mean, just look at that. You can see what appears to be the stagnation point from those 33 Raptor engines exhaust right above the water-cooled steel plate. How amazing is that? It's literally eye candy. Then with the big test complete, SpaceX removed Booster 12 from the orbital launch mount, but there was just one small catch. After attempting to lower Booster 12 onto its transport stand, it had to be raised back up so a loose bit of wiring could be fixed. After a short period of time, it was set back down on the transport stand and the whole down rams were engaged for its roll back to the production site. With all of its standalone testing complete, this rollback should be the final one for Booster 12. Although, given past experience, it's kind of dangerous to say that. While back at the Mega Bay, Booster 12 will be prepared for flight, which will include closing out a whole bunch of different systems and it getting its hot staging ring. I kind of want a hot stage ring hat. Plus, SpaceX may implement any last-minute changes they want to on the booster, which would kind of track with everything we've seen done to every previous flight booster. Back at the production site, this week we've also seen some interesting hardware to be used for the next version of Starship. For example, we've seen parts for the new four-point lifter that will be used to lift ships during stacking operations or just when they're moving them on or off different stands. And you did hear right, it's a four-point lifter now rather than a two-point lifter. For the current version of Starship, SpaceX uses a two-point lifter because on the ship there are two spots for those lifter points to interface with. They're the same lifting points that interface with the chopsticks. However, on Starship version 2, there are now four interfaces. The crane lifting attach points have been deleted from the design and removed from the nose cone, and there are two hard points just under the flaps. So those two hard points, plus the two from the chopsticks, that makes a four-point lifter. By the way, in case you don't remember, those two chopstick lifting points will now be located further down on the body of the ship on Starship version two. We've talked about this a little bit before, and we've even seen evidence of it in hardware form on developmental barrel sections. But to recap, these two lifting points will now be located at the height of the payload bay section. And suffice to say, 
The four-point lifter is going to be quite a wacky piece of hardware to see in use. I certainly can't wait. And speaking of the payload bay for Starship version 2, this week we saw the Starlink Pez dispenser for that next version being moved inside of Mega Bay 2. You can see some stairs attached to it. Those would be in white, while the dispenser is kind of gray in color. Now, don't worry, they're not flying stairs on Starship. These are just part of the auxiliary structure that helps SpaceX workers install and work on this new Pez dispenser. There's some interesting things to note here with the new Pez dispenser. The first one, and probably the most interesting one, is that this is the same size as the previous dispensers. This is somewhat strange, because on Starship version 2, the payload bay section is shorter compared to the current version. This means that the new Pez dispenser will stick into the nose cone volume, which it didn't for Starship version 1. This also means that to install the dispenser into a ship, the entire build process has to change. For the current version of Starship, the Pez dispenser was installed in the payload bay section, and then the nose cone and payload bay section would be stacked together. However, with version 2, the payload bay section and nose cone have to be stacked first, and then that whole assembly lowered down onto the Pez dispenser for installation. It's likely that SpaceX will want to complete this operation inside the Star Factory, you know, at the side closest to the road where the roof is tallest, but that's also the part of the Star Factory that was finished last, and therefore might not exactly be ready to be used for such a thing. Therefore, we're expecting to see this happen inside Mega Bay 2, plus also that's where they rolled the Pez dispenser, so hopefully we get to see this happen inside Mega Bay 2. This means that sometime in the next few days, SpaceX will most likely roll the very first combined nose cone and payload section for Starship version 2 out of the high bay and into Mega Bay 2 so they can install the Pez dispenser in it. At least, that's what all these moves would suggest. And am I excited to see version 2 Starship continuing to be stacked? Yes. Yes, I am. Another interesting thing we saw this week was the Starlink loader box inside the Starlink building. This building is where, back in the day, SpaceX used to deliver and then store the larger version 2 Starlink satellites that were supposed to have already launched on Starship by now, but of course that hasn't happened yet. At some point in the last year or so, the stacks of satellites in this building were removed, and I kind of thought that the entire structure had been repurposed. That is, until we spotted the loader box again. And it's not just the box. Take a close look. It looks like it's full of Starlink satellites. Now, we have no idea if these are new or if they're the same old Starlink satellites that were already here a few years ago. If they're the old Starlink satellites, they may just be testing the loading and unloading of these and may even use it to trial some of the new hardware we've seen floating around. Or if they're new, we have no indication if they're version 2 or version 2.5 or some other different version number of Starlink satellite that SpaceX might have coming down the pipe. Plus, we also don't know when SpaceX finally plans to start launching these on Starship. But frankly, I don't think it'll happen before Starship version 2. It could be that the Pez loader box will be used with the new Pez dispenser that we were just talking about that moved into Mega Bay 2 once it's installed on the first version 2 of Starship. It is completely speculation for now, but it is interesting to note that both of these developments are happening at the same time. In other Starship version 2 news, this week we saw the newest test tank being moved to Massey's for structural testing. This test tank had been put together at the production site for a while, and it seems to be mainly all about the aft section of the new version of the ship. This new aft section design presents a lot of similarities to the current version, but also some significant differences as well. For example, the quick disconnect interfaces are the same ones used in the current version of ship, but the size and number of stringers is a lot different. We can see the stringers on this aft section are thinner, but there are more of them installed. Another change that we'll surely be seeing with the next version of the ship is that the two raceways that currently run right through the middle of the backside of the ship now will be further apart. We can see this on the new test article because the two holes for the raceways are located symmetrically on each side of the quick disconnect port. Added to this, we can also see the newly designed stand and stage connectors at the base of the ship as well as the new aft flap connections. Now, something we get asked frequently, in fact, I was tricked by, is how come we know it's for a ship if there's so many stringers around the top portion of the tank? 
Well, that's just because that massive number of stringers is just for the structural testing only. This ensures that the test tank is the strongest it can be at the top. That way, when they apply pressure to it, the loads go into the aft section, which is exactly what they want to test. When they want to test something in the middle, then the base portion also gets a bunch of extra stringers, and thus all the loads go to the middle section of the test tank, and so forth and so on. After the rollout, the test tank was lifted and then installed into the new structural test stand that had been built at Massey's over the last few months. Once it's all hooked up and ready, it'll undergo structural testing, and hopefully SpaceX can use that to validate their design for Starship version 2. By the way, we usually know the names for these test tanks, but in this case the label was unfortunately ripped off, so we honestly have no idea what to call it. Although, this is the 16th test tank that's been built in Starbase, and thus a lot of us are just informally calling it Test Tank 16. And speaking of things rolling to Massey's, another item that's going to roll to Massey's here very soon, in fact, probably by the time you watch this, is Ship 30, which if you remember, has recently had its entire heat shield overhauled ahead of Flight 5. The whole overhaul has lasted for about a month and a half, and seems to be pretty much complete. In order to carry this out, SpaceX workers had to put up a bunch of extra scaffolding on the corner of the high bay in order to reach all of the tiles. While we can see, visually, that pretty much all of the tiles are now replaced, we've also seen teams removing part of the scaffolding, which is yet another sign that the heat shield replacement is done. So the heat shield's complete. It should be getting ready to roll to the pad and go for a flight, right? Well, not so fast. If you remember, back in early June, Ship 30 had one, or maybe even more, engines replaced while it was inside the high bay. And this led us to think that once the heat shield work was complete, it would be due for some additional engine testing. Well, our guess wasn't far off. There's a road closure for the transportation of a vehicle from the production site to Massey's on Sunday, which is yesterday by the time you watch this. So Ship 30 should already be at Massey's. I don't know, go look on Starbase Live, see if it's there. In fact, the static fire testing stand was rolled from Massey's back to the production site on Friday. So all the pieces are in place for this move to happen. By the way, speaking of that stand, we don't really know what it's actually called other than Ship Static Fire Stand, which is kind of boring, so we've been sort of informally calling it the Crab Stand. If you have any suggestions for what we should call it, throw it in the comments. With Ship 30 set to roll to Massey's for engine testing, it will become only the second ship to have completed static fire tests both on the former suborbital pad and on the Massey's engine test stand. It's going to be really interesting to see what kind of tests SpaceX performs on Ship 30 while it's there, because there might be some extra ones in addition to just a static fire test. We'll have to wait and see. Either way, you better believe we'll talk about it in the next Starbase update. Well, that's going to be it for this week. We're getting closer and closer to Starship Flight 5, and the pieces are beginning to fall into place. Now SpaceX just needs to get approval to return a super heavy booster to the launch site and catch it with a, with a pair of chopsticks. That won't take long, right? Either way, thanks for watching and make sure you do all the standard YouTube things. Click the like button if you want to, subscribe if you haven't, do the bell or whatever so you don't miss when we go live or publish a new video. And don't forget, be excellent to each other.